Welcome to the Beyond Jiu Jitsu podcast. This is episode 116. Or 116 for the, the lay folk. <laughs> today, <laughs> today we have a very special guest. Uh, we haven't done a guest episode in a little bit, so this is really exciting for us. We have Nick Batcher. Nick Batcher on Batcher, the- correct. Batcher, correct. <laughs> yeah. right. Got it right. So Got it right. I, I, I had that like uh, that. We'll talk about that later. The story that you just uh, said off air, running through my mind, I'm like, oh, am I going to be going to fuck this up? Mispronounce his name. Yeah, Nick Batcher is a, uh, a physio, physiotherapist. But also, uh, you have your so three and four in fitness. So you're a PT as well, and a PT. Yeah. You, you double double PT. Yeah. And you're the uh, owner of RX Physio, which is located in Maruba, Sydney. So for all the Sydney folk out there, particularly Jiu Jitsu Sydney guys, we have a fair few that listen. If you're in need of physiotherapy, and we're going to delve into that uh, through the the guts of this episode, definitely check out RX Physio. So Nick, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to chat. Um, obviously, physio-related jujitsu stuff, but yeah, let me – I'll just also plug Nick uh, before we get into it. So oh, I, I, I – Plug away, yeah. plug away. So, so <laughs> I, I, I got uh, – so Joey, one of my black belts, you know, from Jungle Brothers, recommended Nick when I needed a, a physio. And, you know, I've – seen physios on and off for years. And my time in Brazil, I even had like a sponsored physio as part of the program I I had while I was training there. And, you know, I remember I went to, went to see, see you, Nick. And I straight away, like the way that I can't even remember what the first injury was, but like straight away when I went and just the way you assess the situation, I was like, yeah, man, this guy knows what's up. Because I find, especially when you're doing a sport like jujitsu, if you don't see a professional who who, I mean, they don't have to train, but they need to understand what you're asking of your body. Like I've seen physios or, you know, doctors are notorious for it where you go see them and they're like, you're like, oh, it hurts when I do this. And they're like, well, don't do that. You're yeah. like, but I need to be able to do that, you know? So yeah, honestly, anyone who is in Sydney in need of a physio, I send all my students to Nick and not just Nick. So um, Active RX Physio mm. is owned by Nick and his wife, Emma, mm. who is also a physio. And, uh, you know, Nick's the first one I saw because that's who Joe recommended, but I've seen Emma multiple times as well. So they're both physios. Uh, they both work out of it. It's in the Fitness First in Maroubra Junction. So we have listeners who live in that area. Man, if you need a physio, Nick and Emma, the way to go. Appreciate it, guys. Yeah. So kind. let's get straight into it. Um, I want to go with – uh, not a controversial question, but like my <clears throat> question that I want to ask <clears throat> straight off the bat. Actually, let me let me set the the standard first. So, when I don't know if you're aware of this as someone who works in the industry, but my physio in Brazil, uh, he would say to me, he said, "Oh, Australia is regarded as having the best physios in the world," and he was like, "All our textbooks and everything are all written by Australian physiotherapists, and you know, it's like that's the countries look to Australia for where the best physios are." As someone in the industry, is that something that you know, or were you kind of going, "Oh, I didn't know we were considered as the the best physios"? Nah, I definitely knew that. Like the sort of uni process, and then the people that are doing all the research behind the scenes and everything like that are well known to be very good out of Australia. So you always knew that as well. But like at the same time, like Australia has its own limitations too, like not to jump too deep into it straight away. But like, for example, my uh, school, I went to physio, um, ACU, uh, it's Australian Catholic Uni. Um, they were sort of new when they were doing the uh, doing the physio program for us. So I think I was the first like cohort to go through. And so they had to devise the whole new sort of like program essentially. Oh, wow. And so when they were devising the program, they didn't want to include things like ultrasound and indifferential, which is like those spiky machines that go on you, similar to TENS, but a little bit different because essentially all the research on it has been disproven. So, you know, the old school way of physio was you come into physio, we put like the TENS machine on you, it buzzes your your leg, you feel, oh, this must be doing something good. Then they get the ultrasound, it's nice and warm and it wor- works over your leg. You're like, oh, that's warm, that's making must be doing something good for me. And it basically got disproven. Yeah, and, right. And then the physio school tried to say, hey, listen, we don't want to put this in there. Like it's it's not proven anymore. And then the physiotherapy association then went, 
oh, no, we can't have that happen because all the other schools of physio have it in their curriculum. You need to have it in your curriculum. Uh, so even though we are, yeah, one of the leaders, you know, there's still this like timeline between what is actually best and then what is taught, if that makes sense. Yeah. So there's no doubt Australia are really good. Like they've got tons of people that are really high up in the world, well regarded in that regards. But, you know, I think like any sort of profession, there's always room for improvement too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that's probably a, those limitations probably in the grand scheme of things a good thing right because you need some form of regulating body yeah. otherwise otherwise it's then going to turn into a shit show where different schools and unis are teaching whatever the hell they think is correct you yeah know? 100%. so i mean the buck has to stop with someone and obviously you know if a treatment or whatever gets proven or disproven there's always going to be a level of bureaucracy and red tape yeah. that needs and to be delay, passed right? through. Yeah. And delay. And like even things that we do, like we massage, right? Like you've both been there. Like we've come and like, you know, uh, Kieran, you have that sore neck. Obviously we just do a little bit of soft mm. tissue work on it. Massage itself hasn't got great evidence to actually sort of heal anything. And like, you know, gone are the days we're thinking we're actually like lengthening out your muscle as you mm. as we're massaging it and making it better that way, they, they think it's actually more of a neurological response. It gets the body just to sort of go, oh, relax, like calm down. It's not the end of the world. And that starts the healing process a little bit. But like, um, you know, so we still do things that don't have a lot of evidence to it. It's about sort of, as you sort of say, like making sure that you at least think it through. And then, you know, if there is something that doesn't have a lot of evidence and it also doesn't make sense, that's a lot of the time of it, then you sort of try to steer clear of that sort of stuff too. So yeah, you're right. You need, you need managing bodies and you need people just constantly like checking up on these things. And it goes for any sort of thing in the health space. There's always going to be a delay of someone finding out, okay, this new sort of treatment modality we'll use as an example is actually beneficial because you need to, you need to test that. Right. Yeah. And then the other really difficult thing that we go down the jujitsu path of this is right. There's not many studies that are going to study you guys doing jujitsu, right? Mm. Yeah, because I mean, compared to something like rugby or football yeah. or whatever, I mean, it's a relatively niche sport. We have not that many people, you know, you can't. Whereas, yeah, football or soccer or whatever, you can get there's so many people that play it worldwide yeah. that, that mm. your your database of people that could be studied and whatever is and then also way higher. People willing to put money into it, right? Like mm. if. If you're this billion dollar enterprise of like, you know, rugby or NFL or whatever it is, they'll put money behind studies. Whereas jujitsu obviously doesn't have that same number of people competing in it. So they don't have the money behind it or they don't have the whoa, exposure. Whoa, 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 whoa. Am I just learning there's no money in jujitsu? Fuck. <laughs> 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 uh, you've just reminded me of something that I didn't have written down that I wanted to ask, but it is a question that that is kind of, Always something I've wondered about. So when you just saying talking about lengthening and whatever. So when you when you build muscle, right? Yeah. Like you, you know, you want to gain muscle, you know, you're tearing the or breaking the muscle fibers and yeah. then they rebuild and everything. And because you're damaging the muscle essentially, you can't do, you know, you can't do bench press every single day, right? You need some recovery. Whoa, 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 whoa. Let's, <laughs> let's not get out of hand <laughs> here, Adam. Right. Um when you're stretching with a goal, so let's say you're not stretching just to alleviate pain or for mobility or whatever. Let's say you're stretching because you go, oh, well, I'm working towards being full splits flexible. Yeah, yeah. So you're actually stretching, like you're damaging muscles as, as well, right? Or no, like is, is stretching if you had a goal of mass increasing your flexibility, right? Yeah. Uh, is that, okay, well, I can stretch every day? Like, I mean- yeah, you definitely, no, you're not going to be doing damage doing stretching, right? Like so say splits is a good example of like trying to get splits is not like actually tearing the muscle to make it get longer at all. Um, it's more about actually letting the body know that it's like safe in this way. So you'll often find now with people that are trying to get more flexible, they quite often do like loaded stretching. As in like weighted or Yeah, whatever. that or even just like holding your body weight, right? So say in like the splits, right, where you get sort of that front leg out, if we're going to do front foot splits and then the back leg's behind, it'd be actually like holding that position as best you can. You might use chairs to start with to have your hands on there. But by putting some like load into it, it lets your body know, okay, Nick's strong enough to like – be this flexible let's like let him have that length because you don't create length right like it's not like by stretching my hamstrings all of a sudden i've 
you know, grown this extra part of hamstring that allows me to get there. You've got the flexibility to to get there, but your body's probably holding it back is like the theory behind it. So the body's going, okay, Nick's not safe to do the splits here because if he gets into the splits, things will tear because like he's just not strong enough to hold this position. So like building that is like the the key and like loading it up. So it doesn't tear anything. Or so anything is, is part of the limiting factor – uh, neurological. I so, think so. Yeah. So what I'm, you know, let's say for example, <clears throat> if you know I'm lying on the on on the bench or the bed, yeah. in in at your your practice, and you're stretching my hamstring, like you know whatever the pulling that back just to see yeah, how far you like go. pushing it up towards my head yeah. to see where my range is at, and it goes X amount far before you know there's a yeah, yeah. shit ton of resistance and you can't push it anymore. Yeah. If I was then under a general anesthetic and out cold, would you get resistance at the same spot or would I all of a sudden be full splits flexible? Uh, I don't know if you'd be full splits flexible, but you'd definitely be able to get more range. Like if you ever watch any like videos of them, like essentially like doing like hip replacements or any really surgery for that, they always test it out. Like a shoulder is a common one. Like if they're repairing your shoulder, they'll like move it in all these weird and wonderful directions to see that essentially the surgery they've done is giving you a stable shoulder. So like, yeah, there is definitely a neurological component to it. And like, so my strategy to hire an anesthetist to put me under and then pe- have someone stretch me to get flexible is not no really good. No good. Damn. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> we won't see any difference with that. Shit. Oh, so Nick, I, I wanted to ask, this is a brilliant opportunity uh, for us to have you on here. Cause there's, I mean, a lot of jujitsu guys think they know certain things about injuries or, or like the most common injuries or, or what have you just from being on the mats and seeing like, you know, old blogs that, you know, twisted his bloody knee or something like yeah. that. But in your experience, cause you, as Adam said in the outset, you get a lot of jujitsu guys coming in. Yeah. And I, I wanted to start by asking out of all the athletes that you have come into your practice, not a, as, as a percentage, but what sort of, um, what sort of themes do you see amongst different sports? Yeah. Cause I know your background is rugby union. Yeah. You, you play at pretty high level rugby union, actually first grade. Um, so from your experience working with different athletes from different sports, what sort of themes do you see amongst like some of the more common sports? All right. So I guess like, cause I'm located in the gym, I see a lot of like, you know, weekend warriors like myself, I'm a weekend mm-hmm. warrior now, like just go into the gym, you know, yep. doing too much bench press, like we sort of mentioned before. <laughs> oh yeah. But as a <laughs> result, like legitimately shoulders are probably the most common injury I see from just regular gym goers, like guys that like to do weights, like shoulders are the most common. And the reality is it probably is as much as we're joking about bench press is the fact that everyone in the gym and we all did it right. When you start out at the gym, you do all the muscles that you can see in the mirror. So you're yeah. doing your biceps and your shoulders and your pecs. And you go at them like crazy and then all of a sudden your shoulder starts going, geez, like I wouldn't mind some support at the back there. And like because you haven't done any Uh, sort of back, like a lot of the time it might just be that. But then the other thing that – and I just actually listened to, uh, you know, a different podcast. (gasps) You know, How dare you? (laughs) (laughs) We unplug it. We like to plug everyone Uh, on this What podcast? Uh, It was Mark Bell's podcast. So it's an American podcast. He's a big sort of like weightlifter. Um, legend. So, um, but anyway, he had a guest on and he was sort of saying before, like a lot of his, uh, the guests that I was saying, and I can't remember his name for the life of me off the top of my head, um, but was saying like, he's seeing a lot of injuries in terms of shoulders because like the reality is people love doing bench press, right? Mm. So they do bench press day in, day out, or not day in, day out, let's say two times a week Mm. for the last 10 years. And so it just has your shoulder in the same position with heavy weight for the same repetitive motion, Mm every time for 10 years and he's suggesting maybe that's a reason why people are getting these like shoulder complaints a lot of the time is because they don't add variety to those sort of things. Whereas back you'll add variety to do on sort of like a pull, you'll do a lap pull down, you'll do a, you know, a bent over row and then you'll do one on the machine where your hands are facing inward. So you have so much more variety, whereas bench it's always like, got to do my flat bench. I got to do my incline bench. I got to do my dumbbell bench press. It's all the same. It's all the same movement. Yeah. Shoulders in the position all the same time. And that sort of creates injury. So it might be good with that. And who knows why the reason is, but that would be the most common one in the gym. I reckon jiu-jitsu, you got to break it down to sort of two different people, like people that are new to jiu-jitsu and then people that are more experienced at jiu-jitsu, all right? So have done sort of, let's say, five-plus years. And, like, new to jiu-jitsu, you're going to get a lot of, like, just little niggles. And I, I often say it to when someone comes in and they're sort of – they are new to jiu-jitsu and they're sort of like, oh, my knee's just a little bit banged up. And then we'll sort of treat them once and then, like, next week they'll come in and it's like, it's pretty much good. And we're like, hey, listen, there was nothing major worried with – 
nothing major to worry about with it. Like with these jujitsu injuries at this stage, just like give it a little bit of time. If it feels really bad and you feel a pop or something, yeah, definitely come on in. But otherwise, like some of these niggles like just they go away essentially, yeah. right? Like you guys would know. Like do you do you do you find you part of your your work is trying to I don't know. Well, I guess the, the question I'm asking is like, how do you kind of deal with hypochondriacs? Because this is something that I also say to anyone that I recommend go see you is I say, man, like one of the, yeah. you, you know, physios or, you know, I guess chiros are more n- notorious for it, but let's just put them together for once. Yeah. Bad physios and chiros or massage therapists or whoever yeah. – are notorious for that whole like come see me twice a week for the next eight weeks, yeah. you know, sort yeah. of thing. And something that I'll that I say to everyone, I was like, man. And the other thing that's amazing about Nick is he'll straight up tell you like, don't yeah. come back. You're welcome to come back, but I'll just be standing here telling you to do that stretch that yeah. you can be doing by yourself. And yeah. you know, so it's something that if you say to me, man, you don't need to be here. Like I know I don't need to be here. Yeah. Right. So. You're not going to, if you had a hypochondriac in there, I know you're not going to be, you're not about drumming up the business. So do you find <laughs> for you sometimes there's, especially with these new jujitsu people, you're kind of politely trying to tell them yeah. there's nothing wrong. Yeah, you Go gotta, away. You got to be delicate with it, right? Because you don't want to, and it sometimes like scares them off physios because they're like, there is something wrong. Why won't this guy believe me? There's something wrong. But like, you know, you just got to try to put in like a perspective for them and like to, you know, if they've been doing a sport beforehand and it'd be like, oh, yeah, you know, I used to play rugby. It's like, hey, did they ever get, like, sore after rugby? It's like, oh, yeah, I used to get all the all the time sore. And it's like you knew you were going to get sore from rugby so you wouldn't go see a physio about it. This is the same thing. It's just a different sport, right? Like mm. you're just going to get different niggles, right? Like in rugby you're going to have less of, you know, neck niggles because, like, you rarely get sort of put, hopefully nowadays, they're cracking down on it into really bad neck positions, whereas jiu-jitsu, right, like, you're constantly driving your head into someone's chest or you're looking up from the bottom and your neck's mm. flexed. So your neck's like constantly working. And so if you're not used to that, you'll often get a like a jacked up neck. And that will be the, probably the second most common for like really sort of, you know, young jujitsu guys is they'll come in and they'll be like, I got a bit of a sore neck. And you're sort of like, what's happened? It's like, oh, we're working on like guillotines for the first time. It's like, yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, like yeah. your yeah, neck's going to be. snap downs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Your neck's going to be a bit sore. I was like, oh, I went for a takedown. Someone just like pushed my head down. It's like, that's that like that's going to like hurt your neck for the first time. And like mm-hmm. the more you do it, it's going to feel better because your neck's going to get stronger as it. Like you look at any like a lot of like top level, especially like the wrestlers, right? Like top level wrestlers, like their necks look like a tree trunk. They don't right? have necks, yeah, bro. Exactly. They have a head and right? shoulders. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we've got, so you're, you're saying that the themes are sort of upper body. We're looking at things like shoulders, necks. Oh, uh, and also knees. Knees are a common one, like for the right. first, first like uh, for, for newbies, if we're just gonna say newbies as a, as a word. Mm-hmm. Um, just because you'll get like your, your knee twisted a little bit. Yeah. More often or not, it is like just like a, a joint line irritation. It's like, oh, my knee didn't enjoy being in that position. Mm. With the sort of more seasoned practitioners of jiu-jitsu, you're looking at proper knee injuries like meniscus and everything like that. Yeah. So anyone that's been doing it for five plus years, like they're obviously dedicated to it at that stage as well. Yeah. And they're probably like have pushed through all these little niggles and quite often they would have had their knee like in a bad way, felt like a little pop. Saw for maybe a, a, a week or two, might have got it looked at, might not have got it looked at, sort of settled down and then they're back, to, back at the races, so to speak, and then like, you know, a year later they have the same thing happening. Like, oh, this happened. And then like, you know, year five might rock up or year six, seven, whatever it is, and they sort of like have a bigger incident. It's like, oh, geez, my knee, like it's probably happened maybe three or four times in the mm. last five years. And the reality is they probably had like small little meniscal tears. That is probably the most common, I reckon, in like – more seasoned jujitsu guys. Yeah. I think coming from like a, a on the ground perspective, that's probably what most guys worry about in jujitsu in terms of injury. Yeah. Like, yeah, you always have your shoulder and things like that and your arms, but in, in terms of like trying to fight out of a submission, I'm more willing to try harder to f- fight, sorry, to, to let it go longer with like something like an elbow yeah. than I would with a knee, like yeah. a heel hook. I think particularly because of all these horrific injuries that come from heel hooks, which is, you know, probably the very minuscule percentage of knee injuries come from an actual submission in a heel hook. Yeah. It's more probably from like a twisting out of a weird position or, or weird yeah, movement. So um, but knees is the biggest sort of fear, I suppose, for injury. I reckon it's a big fear as well because it often results in like surgeries as mm. well, right? So like 
yeah, Adam excluded. Like you don't get <laughs> you don't get as many surgeries of your elbow, right? Like yeah. you know, and that's probably a, just a wear and tear thing for many years of uh, doing jujitsu. But like with knees, and especially like it's getting less now. But like say f- the last like even five to ten years, you tear your meniscus, they basically nearly operate straight away. Mm. Nowadays, we're realizing okay. We can actually strengthen the muscles around here. We can deal with small little tears and sort of life can go on. And the same's happening with ACLs, which is probably everyone's biggest fear because it's uh, it's the big one. You're out for like a year or so, give or take, you know, nine months to a year with it with the with the injury. Um, but like even they're seeing nowadays with ACLs, you can actually try to sort of like um, conservatively manage them as well. So. Yeah. Um, I, I actually know uh, a couple of guys from my gym back in Brazil who <laughs> lost their ACLs and just never never yeah. replaced it and just still went on. Obviously, there was a bit of rehab period, but just went on to to continue to train and compete at a yeah. really high level, just very understanding that they don't have an ACL anymore yeah. and that their, their knee has more give in this particular direction. Yeah, well, like it could nearly be advantageous to your sport, right? <laughs> like if you can sort of withstand to get it like hyperextended a little bit more, it's like, oh, this is okay. We, my knee can just like <laughs> a double bend around this, so to speak. But yeah, and like this sort of like ties back into that very first thing when we were talking about the delay of like, I guess the best treatment management and it becoming like the norm in society. Like Mm. this is like real early days in sort of ACLs being the like, okay, let's conservatively manage an ACL. So like they've started to develop protocols, but like the people they're testing them on is only sort of a small number of people and they're, you know, relatively young, healthy people. They're not going to go into jujitsu, right? So it's not going to be tested on jujitsu guys. Um, But yeah, there's definitely like that sort of movement around there, which will hopefully put a little bit of fear away from people and their knee injuries. But I think, yeah, knees are super common for you guys. And I reckon you're more willing to fight out of like elbows and everything because you feel like nearly more in control when it's oh, your definitely. hands, right? Yeah, like yeah. like even if you're not in control, there's a there's the element of like I feel in control because I can move. You're more dexterous through mm. your shoulders and elbows versus like your, your knee, so to speak. So mm. um, I reckon that's probably half the reason why there's that fear for, for knees. So following on from that, we have – we've identified like three sort of key body parts of your or areas. We've got shoulders, neck, and knees. yeah. yeah. What can someone do to help front load the the prevention of that? Like knowing that these areas are, uh, you know, the most common. Yeah. I think there's a couple of things, right? Like definitely being more flexible is going to be beneficial to you, right? Because if you are getting put into like a weird position and like I'll use my limited knowledge of like jujitsu positions and like submissions and stuff, but like let's say a, a Kimura, right, which mm. is a heavy like yeah, movement around like it's going to require a lot of like internal rotation of your shoulder. Mm-hmm. If you're really flexible through there, you're going to have more margin to sort of get put in that position without getting an injury from it. Whereas if you're super stiff and you get put in there, like essentially that muscle goes, geez, I can't be in this position. I've never been here before. And it, it might give, so to speak. Whereas if you're more flexible, it'll allow that person to push you into a, a bigger position. The caveat to that is if you are really flexible to that, you might sort of not end up sort of tear in the muscle, but you might end up relying on the joint more to sort of like be the last uh, point of defense, which often then might result in some sort of dislocation as well. So there's like a, you want to be flexible, but you also need to have strength in that flexibility. So that's probably like the second point, like being strong in, and I'll say the weird and wonderful positions. I'll say like the weird and wonderful because my wife listened to the other podcast I was on with uh, the Jungle Brothers one with Joey and she said, you say weird and wonderful so many times. <laughs> so, and it came in my head. I was like, I've got to say it. Shout out moment. to M. Um, but um, yeah, so you get in these like weird positions, right? That's not normal for everyday life. You need to be strong in that position because mm. if you're not strong in that like really flexible position, you'll end up like not relying on your muscles to sort of strengthen, be the strength that's holding it together and you'll sort of get onto your joints. And once you're relying on your joints, that's when things can happen that's not so good. So I reckon right. flexibility, but then strengthen that flexibility. And I reckon the third big thing for it is also getting exposure to it as well, right? The more you get put in the Kimura, the more you'll be comfortable in that position, the more your body will recognize, okay, you know, this isn't the most comfortable position, but we can sort of withstand that. And you'll also get a better knowledge of like where your end point is, right? Right. Because the first time you get put in any sort of submission, and I remember um, Joey was showing me how he hurt his knee. He's like, let me just get you into a heel hook. And I was like, okay. (laughs) (laughs) This is the position. And he's like, I'm just going to slowly bring this on. And you're just like – 
feel the pressure building and building. Yeah. And obviously Joey's, you know, very smart, obviously not trying to help me as well with it. Mm. And so he's just like slowly building that pressure. And I was like, oh, yeah, I can really feel this. Yeah, so this is giving yeah. me an understanding of what you guys go through. And so if my body gets exposed that repetitively and repetitively and repetitively and repetitively, it will probably develop some degree of like strength or, you know, capacity to tolerate that as well within reason. And I'll also realize when it's coming on and be able to tap out quicker because mm. that's probably the thing that you see all the time with like, you know, sort of those like lower belts, like your whites and stuff like that, that they sort of probably try to fight their way out of it. They think they're right. fighting their way out of it and they end up, <laughs> oh, not this incident again. Fucking like point it to me. <laughs> What's going on here? And then they might turn into it and actually create more problem for themselves, right? Yeah, but I think it's a good point, like you said, that, yeah, the on the flip side of that though, yeah, there is if it then re- relies on the joint. And I don't know if this is the exact same thing, but, you know, you, you briefly briefly mentioned, oh, you don't often have surgery on your elbow, you know, laughing at me because I had that <laughs> yeah. that elbow surgery, which was to remove bone spurs, mm. for those who don't know, being like extra bone that had grown in the joint from, yeah. you know, repetitive wear and tear yeah. on the joint, which then turned into some bone fragments and everything. So I don't know if, you know, that was a, a decades-long progression of the joint or whatever. But, yeah, I don't know if it's a similar thing, right? Was that because – there was too much load go. Maybe there was too much flexibility in the elbow. So then all that wear and tear was going on the joint instead of the muscles. Then it built up over the years. It'd be hard to say if it was like too much flexibility, but like it's from repeated stress. So like bone grows in re- response to repeated stress. So it would have just been that sort of like, whether it was just getting like stretched out into like some sort of arm bar, like repetitively, or whether there was an actual incident originally that hurt it, as a result, you got some inflammation in there and then like, and this could have been an incident that was like not big for you. And so it was like, oh yeah, just jarred up my elbow. And then like for a couple of weeks, you sort of just like worked through it and it just like irritated a little bit, but like eventually it just like settled down. That could have been the response to stress, but more often than not something like that, it's just like wear and tear as well. So would you say as well, one of the, especially for jujitsu guys, one of the big important factors to, trying to prevent injuries would be understanding your personal problem areas because everyone's body's different, right? Oh. So some people are going to be prone to having super shitty shoulders, whereas the other dude's going to be like, I've never had a problem. Like me, for example, it's my knees. That's where, you know, 99% of my jiu-jitsu injuries have come from, have been knee-related injuries. So would you say that's a big important factor as well for you as the individual understanding that, hey, I don't have a great lower back or whatever it is yeah definitely like everyone's going to be different like we sort of tried to sort of group them as like the most common but like depending on your like training history and i don't even mean like jujitsu training history if you sort of had a like years of like you know you're a power lifter you'll probably end up sort of having like maybe tighter shoulders or something mm-hmm. like that if you've had years of being a gymnast you're probably going to find that yeah you're going to be hypermobile so then Going into jiu-jitsu, you might end up sort of irritating joints more because you sort of rely on those joints. So definitely you got to like – and that goes for every sport, right? Like it's not just jiu-jitsu. Like, and it goes for life in general, right? Like some person's that guy that always has like the sore lower back or some guys are the guy that's had the sore knee since his car accident or since his footy incident as well. Mm-hmm. Like there's definitely always going to be like an individual element to it and you should be like just working on those individual elements. Like you don't want to be that guy that's just go, oh, you know, I, I hurt my uh, knee – 10 years ago and it's just never been the same. Like, you What know, have you done about it? Oh, nothing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, That's so funny because whenever I was complaining, particularly my neck, I was complaining about my neck for like three or four weeks. So this was nearly a month I was yeah. complaining. He's like, oh, so what did Nick say about it? And just crickets. Like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's like, oh, okay then. Like yeah. obviously you knew I didn't fucking go see yeah. Nick. <laughs> so with just- But I did eventually, eventually. just to clarify. Yeah. With the neck, so you're saying like, uh, you know, your problem area or whatever being strong and mobile in those areas uh, like or flexible or whatever. Uh, I did want to ask specifically to the neck because we mentioned that as one of the areas you see people have problems with. If we said knees, for example, and then you say, oh, you need to be more, you know, more flexible and strong and mobile. Most people who Mm. train would be like, okay, stretch the muscles in my legs, do squats, whatever. Like it's pretty, you can- Intuitive. Very intuitive. But your neck, like if someone said, how do you get a more flexible neck or a stronger, like it's to someone who's not educated about strength, conditioning, mobility, like 
people wouldn't know, well, how, what do I do to make my neck stronger to protect it for jujitsu? Uh, oh, perfectly. Like good question. Right. Because the reality is like when we go through our like training phase or like you sort of start training, right? Like everyone's like, oh, okay, you're doing strengthening your legs. Like you do some squats, leg extensions, you know, you know what those muscles do. Like even if you mm. don't train, like if you're kicking your ball, you sort of know, like people mostly say like when they come in with a knee injury, it's like, oh, I think it's my quad or something like that. They know the, like the name of the muscles. They know what it sort of really does, mm. but we never really train the neck, right? Like you rarely go to a, you know, a Globo gym like Fitness First where I sort of uh, have our practice inside of and see someone like working their neck. They're not strapping the sort of the harness on the head, getting on the cable machine and then like moving their neck around. But the reality is that's the way to strengthen your neck. We just we just don't really do it because normal life doesn't really demand you to have like a really strong neck. But you look at the sports like we sort of mentioned uh, wrestling, like they'll mm. do specific neck strengthening. They'll do a lot of like, you know, bridges on their their necks and stuff like that, which is controversial, but it's still going to build up strength into it. And then like you look at like forwards, like in rugby, like we're talking front row forwards and everything like that, they're going to be strengthening their necks as well. Okay? The sport I always refer to is, is Formula One. Yeah. They, they massive – they actually have a whole setup where – they essentially sit like they would yeah. in the race seat in the car with a helmet on that's strapped to like cable machines. And pulls them around. And they, yeah, and they- What do you I, mean Formula One? The car does all the work? Yeah, though. yeah. What are you talking about? Yeah. I think they do, I think the average formula, it was not that long ago I, I read this, but I could have my numbers wrong. I think it's the average Formula One driver, like they, they quite routinely- you know, do like sixty kilos from the head. I'm sure they'd have to. It's Just crazy. I saw they had. G-force, I saw. Right? Yeah, That's I saw nice. they had one of the drivers and one of the um, pit crew or whatever. They were doing like a little challenge in the back uh, of the pits, and they had. They had like two chairs yeah. and they're essentially doing a side plank, but yeah, just with their, their just with the side of their head on the chair. And yeah. it was like who could hold it the longest? Obviously the driver could, yeah. you know, like but yeah, they pull like six G's or whatever. So though these sports do a lot of it, but yeah, and that's I, what you gotta do, I right? Think without right. being trained. So without getting a Formula One machine like if you're someone who just goes to fitness first or is in the jiu-jitsu gym yeah the, the best way is probably just like using your hands themselves so right if you're like i guess for people listening like you sort of tuck your chin put your hands on the back of your head and then like you legitimately just resist your chin coming up all right with your hands so it's just like a self-resisted mm-hmm. like neck strengthening exercise and you can do it in all different directions right you just put the hands on the side of the head so if left ear goes to the left shoulder right hand goes to right ear and you sort of just force your head towards your right side. And they're just like some self-strengthening neck exercises. They're going to be like the easiest ones to, to work on. Um, there, you know, there are sort of products out there. I think it's for the iron. The iron neck. Neck. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I've always wanted sort of, to try one. They look cool. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if they're gimmicky or not, but no, I, mean, I think they actually work. I think they're good for like neck strengthening, but I think they're going to set you back like a couple hundred bucks as well. I would right? imagine. So yeah. Most people are going to not like go out and like purchase that. Mm. You can get like sort of really sort of uh, medieval type sort of structures where you legitimately get like a, it's like a band that goes around your head, say from your forehead, just above your eyes, all the way around to the back of your head. And then it has like a string that, or more likely a chain that sort of goes off and you can legitimately like tie like a weight to it and then just lift your head up and down mm. using that. Well, so that's when, a cheaper uh, version of it. When so I, you can jury rig sink at home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when I, when I trained Muay Thai years ago, they, this is before jujitsu, they had a, I can't remember how heavy the kettlebell was, but they had a kettlebell with a, a rope tied to yeah. it, and you'd literally just hold the rope in your teeth. Oh, and that's a, that's a no from me, dog. Right? Yeah, <laughs> I shan't be recommending that. Yeah, yeah. getting a yeah. dentist bill afterwards. <laughs> yeah. Oh shit. But I guess I'd get the job done. No, hundred percent. Yeah. And that's like, like strength training is all about, and it doesn't matter what body part is like finding what that muscle does and then loading up that muscle. So like the same goes with like using those hands or using your teeth like that. Like as long as there's a weight that's pulling your neck in one direction and you can Mm -hmm. sort of force it against in that other direction, uh, that'd be really beneficial. And even just doing like isometrics, which are essentially when you don't actually move through the range. So again, if you imagine you sort of put your uh, hand on your forehead and then just press into your hand with your neck, you might not actually move, but you're still building up strength to it. So best way to sort of liken that too is like if you're doing a bicep curl because most people know what a bicep curl is if you sort of stop halfway and just hold that position you're still going to get strong in that position in your mm-hmm. in your biceps like you're not going to get strong through that whole range but you'll probably develop some strength extra through your biceps so you can just do those as like 
at home remedies, I guess, for the best way to sort of strengthen your neck. But again, I reckon training will do a lot of it too, right? Because your neck will get into positions. Like if you're playing from the bottom, you're sort of Just keeping your head up. off. Yeah, the exactly. Yeah. So then you're constantly in an isometric position from that sort of position. Yeah. So like mm. that'd be other little bits. But then, you know, the little caveat to that again is always there is one um you know if that is like the first time you're getting into that and like say you're again we'll use a white belt again that hasn't been in that position but you spend an hour in the bottom position the next day you're gonna have have a a pretty sore neck neck, yeah Yeah. and Mm -hmm. like it's not the end of the world it's just like just like if you haven't done bicep curls for ages and you do a lot of bicep curls you're gonna have sore biceps so it's funny like what i'm picking up from this is in some some muscle groups that we don't normally train at the gym. We don't normally, you know, go do neck curls or what, yeah. what have you. So when you put it in a, a situation in a sport like jujitsu, where you are training those muscles, you can, a lot of people would misinterpret essentially DOMS yeah. as, Hey, this is, this is pain. This is, this is a problem. This is an injury. Yeah. hundred percent. I reckon that is like, again, another, like when we, you know, not to say the words hypochondriacs, but like, that's a lot of the time what it might be. I've definitely had people that have come in and it's just like they essentially have doms <laughs> but rather than sort of, you know, just go, Hey, listen, you've just got doms like yeah. toughen up. It's sort yeah. of like, Oh, you've irritated it. So nothing big to worry about because you, you want to like listen to their concerns, right? Cause you don't want to be dismissive. Cause if you're dismissive, like they're just going to be like, that guy sucks. And, and yeah. you know, and, and, and that oh, like pain is subjective as well. Yeah, right. True. Like, so you can't really quantify. Yeah. yeah. You know, and you can have really bad doms. Like, um, I did sprints for the first time. Oh, this is oh, like, you eight, were down. <laughs> like 18 months ago, right? Like I was getting ready to play in a rugby tournament I played in not too long ago and like I hadn't done sprints for who knows how long. And I did sprints and like my hip flexors and hips like were sore for like two weeks. And Holy I was like, this shit. is just like absolutely killing me. I was like, this is why people come in like this. Like I should <laughs> have more empathy in my life. It was uh, unbelievable. And then like I'm doing a sprint now basically every week and like I don't get sore through them anymore. Mm. But like that first week it felt like I got hit like by so, a train. So you, you maintained that workout. So you're still doing sprints? I'm still doing sprints. Like I realized like I enjoyed it and I yeah. probably shouldn't have stopped doing it. And plus, you know, again, I'm a weekend warrior. So I want to sort of be like, I want to be able to do a sprint, right? I yeah. shouldn't be like pulling up so sore after doing, you know, an hour's worth of like exercise of sprints and stuff like that. Yeah. So I try to keep on top of that. That's part of the, on the, on the normal training schedule at the moment. Mate, you're a better man than me. I always go through these cycles where my cardio is really good and then I'll let it slip. And then when I come back to cardio, it fucking rocks my world. Yeah. Like exactly like you're explaining. And I say to myself, oh, I'm never letting it slip again. Yeah. Never again. Always do. Yeah, Fucking like goes out the window. There's just too much <laughs> like that. It just means there's probably too much you want to do, right? It's like yeah. the same with me. Like the most common question I get whenever you send someone to me is like, oh, do you actually train jujitsu? I was like, do you I actually don't. train, bro? Yeah, <laughs> I don't actually. And it's like, I just don't have the the time commitment to it. Or like, I don't prioritize it, put it yeah, that way. Yeah. Like I love going to the gym and like lifting weights. So like I do that like five times a week. I do sprints once a week and then I surf every now and then as well. So like I don't have like time in my schedule to do jujitsu as much as I reckon I'd enjoy it. So if I win like that 160 million lotto that's on Thursday, you know, uh, I'll, get, uh, I'll be down at uh, advantage uh, the next week. <laughs> We're working on it. We're working on it. We'll, we got time. We got time. <laughs> um, but like, yeah, it's just like if you don't do something, like you'll, you'll get banged up for it. But like, yeah, in terms of like me going back to that sort of what I was just on with the jujitsu and stuff like that, like it's just about prioritizing time, right? So you can't do everything. Mm. Yeah, but isn't that funny, eh? Like you could be – you know, uber fit, but if you do something, you know, that's outside of your oh, yeah. real house, like unless you're yeah. an Iron Man or, you know, uh, you know, maybe a, a CrossFit Games athlete where they do like, yeah. you know, a very massive yeah. spectrum of like you could be whoever, like Conor McGregor, or you could mm. be, you know, one of the most elite athletes in the world, but then all of a sudden you you go for a swim and you haven't done or a surf or something. And then you're going to have doms like nobody's business. You go like fucking rock climbing or something. Your hands are like, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it it just goes to show that each sport, obviously this is obvious, but each sport has its own strengths and weaknesses. Like each sport has its own requirements. Yeah. It's unique demands, right? Mm. Like there'd be no doubt if I went down and did like jujitsu for a week, I'd be so sore that week. 
Like yeah. there'd be no doubt about yeah. it, right? And it'd be my neck or something like that, something that yeah. I sort of don't don't normally train or something like that. I'd be sore, just the same as as you said. If I did rock climbing, mm. my hands would probably kill or something. Yeah, like and your that. forearms and yeah. everything. Okay, so I had, a, I had a bit of a scenario that yeah. I wrote up that I want to throw to you because I think this one's um, you know pretty common to most people. So I'm going to reference my notes here. But so the scenario is that you're tr- you're training jujitsu and you've just had what you think may be an injury. So maybe you've heard a pop or something, or maybe a submission was thrown on really tight and you, you know, you, you couldn't tap in time. And, and so you're feeling, or, or you just fell over or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, so you're feeling that it could be an injury. What should someone's initial reaction be in that scenario? Should you stop training immediately and sort of like let your body cool down? Cause a common thing. And you even hear it, guys like tear their meniscus completely, but they, they go, Oh, okay. No, it's not, it's, it's feeling all right now. And then they start training again. Cause yeah. it's still warm. Like there's adrenaline, you know? Uh, so it sort of masks your pain. And even if you have a pre existing injury and you come into it, like, uh, like my shoulder sore at the moment, but as soon as I get warmed up, it's good. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, um, what, what should you do in your initial action to a potential injury? I think it depends, right? Like I don't think there can be like a black and white with it. I think you need to sort of have like a bit of a, like a, a self-assessment of it. And like everyone's own self-assessment will be obviously totally different to each other. Cause as we said, like pain subjective and stuff like that, injury history, mm-hmm. all subjective. But like, I guess I often say to people, if you'd be embarrassed to tell me what you did, <laughs> then it means like you've done the wrong thing, right? right? Like, so someone might come in and go, I felt a pop. I tried to stand up and my knee gave way. And then I was feeling warm, so I just, like, kept rolling. Sort of like, yeah, you probably knew that wasn't the worst thing to do. And quite often when they're telling me the story, they'll sort of, like, go, I felt a pop and then, like, and then they'll sort of just, like, start umming and ahhing. It's like they don't want to say what they yeah. did. It's like, yeah, you probably did the wrong thing. So, <laughs> I know what you did. <laughs> yeah. so but like, you could also go the other way, like, if you, you know, you could also say if you're embarrassed to tell me you don't need to be here. Someone's like, oh, man, like, you know, my back's really sore. What would you do? sneezed you know yeah, <laughs> yeah. there's right. definitely the, the you could go both ways on it for sure but um i guess like it's it's a hard question to answer i think like you've got to think like about it and whether like you're like just if you feel it's bad like you normally have a pretty good intuition on most things if it's like really decently bad but like if you hear like a big pop and like it feels unstable yeah of course like yeah. stop training or if it like if you get back into it and then like every time you get like even not even in a position but you just like move and you we'll use a knee as an example because we've been using it nonstop is like it just like oh geez it hurt like a little bit every time it hurt a little bit every time and like if that's little bits like for you, like an understanding of like more than that, like one or two out of 10, it's probably, hey, let's pull it on that sort of session. Mm-hmm. Obviously, if you're getting those like high numbers of pain or like say it's like swollen up, like huge in that sort of, you know, within the sort of five minutes of you sort of going, ah, oh, just like let them see how it's happened. Like you want to pull out of it at that stage as well because that swelling is is your body telling you there's something wrong. Like inflammation markers are essentially coming to that area to go, we need to fix whatever the hell happened is, whatever that is essentially but well to to narrow it down then a little bit yeah let's make it a little bit more specific so let's say it is you know um your joint like shoulder elbow yeah knee or ankle let's or make it more specific you know? shoulder elbow no no, knee. But, you know, yeah. no but like <laughs> let, let, let's say it's not as vague as oh something doesn't feel right let's say one of your joints did pop mm. at pop like you know so Firstly, what exactly is happening in the joint? I yeah. know that would obviously depend on yeah, the joint. Yeah, no, but right. what's happening in the joint when mm. you feel and hear it pop? And then, yeah, so if there is a pop, is that then instantly – is it ice? Is it mm. what? Like I know the whole ice argument. One week there's a report, yeah, uh, a paper it's saying it's good. Bad. The next is not. So, um, But, yeah, what's then – what's re- happening in the joint and what should you do? I reckon that's a – that's a pretty good way to get semi-specific. Uh, <laughs> semi-specific. Yeah. Um, but I, Semi. So like everyone knows when you crack your knuckles, right, you feel that pop in like your, your joints like, mm. you okay? So you get a feeling of like say it's your knee, your shoulder or your elbow. Like if you get that like pop and you normally get that like pop, like for example, my ankles, like if I roll them around, they just crack, 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 mm-hmm. crack, 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 crack. So if you get a pop like that that like is semi-normal for you and it fe- or if it's not even normal but it feels like just like sort of like that feeling of cracking your knuckles or cracking your – your neck or something like that i wouldn't stress too much about that for the first one if you feel that pop and like for anyone that's had like a significant like 
injury to their knee, shoulder, elbow again, if we use all those like areas and you feel that like, it's nearly like a pop, but you're sort of like, Ooh, something feels like it, it's torn there. I would almost say it goes, it like starts snap. blurring from a pop to a thud. Yeah. Like when it goes, <laughs> did, your, did your knee go? Like, did it really thud? Did you hear it? When, when for my surgeries. Yeah. So it's slightly different with that injury though. Like the way, I mean, Bucket like, handle tear, right? Yeah, I think is that what they call it yeah, in English yeah, yeah. as well? Yeah. Um, I think slightly different, right? Like, so it wasn't a complete like- No, uh, so because yeah. like the meniscus essentially folds in half and right. gets like stuck in the joint. Yeah. And when it unfolds, it makes a really relieving thunk sound. Because yeah. like, when it's not folded and trapped, life's good. Mm. But yeah, it's like when from in my case, it like folded in and then wouldn't pop back out. And that's right. when you can't walk and off to surgery. But right. yeah, it's quite- it's definitely quite audible. I mean, I don't think as loud as- It scares know. the shit out of you. Like I was training with a guy, uh, this was a couple months ago, but I, I I don't think I'll forget this anytime soon. I was heel hooking them and they weren't tapping. And then all of a sudden there was three very distinct pops from their knee. Yeah. Like one I feel like pop, pop, pop. And I just fucking let go. I'm like, you all right? He's like, yeah, yeah. I'm fine. Like, no, I'm all right. I, I don't know if he was just like playing it off or whatever, yeah. but what, what's going yeah, on so, there? Well, yeah, I reckon is- like the the triple pop like that's probably even like a, a better sign. It could be an absolute nightmare where like three ligaments have absolutely gone and it'd be <laughs> really bad. But if you're getting someone in that position, you'll probably sort of know it. Like you'll be mm. at that real end range where, you know, you're probably in a competition and you're thinking about mm. killing the bloke and you essentially just like yeah. really yank on it. Is, um, is what you're saying kind of like the fact that, yeah, it could be, you know, un- unfortunate, severe, multiple ligaments. But is what you're but saying- But less that, likely, I yeah, reckon. Yeah, it's more like section. how you're saying with your ankle. It yeah, might exactly. be something just, they have yeah, just so kind of go- Yeah, and it <laughs> might just- <laughs> Really <laughs> nicely. <scrat. laughs> it might just be like a muscle even flicking over a bony prominence as well, right? So like when you oh. crack your knuckles, um, essentially it's gas entering the joints and it makes that popping sensation. It's why right. when you crack your knuckles and then you can't crack it again or when someone cracks yeah. your back, right, and then if they try to do the exact same cracking maneuver, it won't crack again. So it's just gas entering the joint because it hasn't been sort of pushed to that range for ages mm. um, and then so once gas is already in the joint you can't put more gas in there so it won't crack again so that could be mm. number one on what it sort of is uh, number two it could be yeah like a ligament or a bone just flicking over a bony prominence so that's what happens with my ankle is essentially like some of the ligaments just flick over like bony prominences and it's not going to like wear away at my ligaments or anything like that it's just my makeup from having somewhat flexible ankles and everything like that so right. that's probably going to be more that like triple pop so to speak right. all right again Again, to use the word caveat, the caveat to that is it could be extremely bad where you've popped your ACL, torn your meniscus and torn your MCL. And then <laughs> Don't think it was. And he was walking. <laughs> then go see a doctor. Yeah. Um, and then like thirdly, like the the pops where they feel like a thud, you are sort of pretty right on that. Mm. For like, And we'll use the ACL as like a, an example with that. Like when you tear your ACL, the ligament itself ruptures, but what the ligament stops is basically your shin bone going forward on your thigh bone, if that makes sense. So shin bone coming forward, as a result of the rupture, what essentially happens is that thigh bone jams into the top of the inside of your knee and that can be that thud sensation as well. And so (laughs) whenever you get like an ACL scan, 99 times out of 100, you'll have some bony bruising on the top and inside of your shin yeah, right. because that thud from the ligament breaking and then it goes, oh, no one's there to support me anymore and it just goes bang into wow, it and you get that crazy. sort of thud. So those thuds are quite often not that sort of a good sign as well. And then I reckon like this is like a, a tough one. Again, we'll use the knee as an example and like something like the ACL, it can be like extremely painful at the time because that – ligament gets fully ruptured right and it's like torn in half so a piece of string just chopped straight in half Mm. quite often afterwards you will definitely get like some degree of instability but it actually isn't that painful so you quite often see like say when a footy player does it and you see them like you know sidestep and they go down and they're like oh that looks like an acl no one was even near him and he just sort of sidestepped they'll sort of stay down for ages and then they don't look in that much pain and then they'll sort of like limp off with the assistance of the trainer but they're still putting weight and everything on it and they're probably not in that much pain at that stage because all the like the nerve endings have ripped with it as well. 
So, so would it be more painful uh, if it was a partial tear? Quite often, yeah. So yeah. you can sometimes find that – and like a meniscus is a really good example in this because like rarely do you just like tear all the way through your meniscus. You like partially tear it, like a little like lip of it comes off. If you think of it like a piece of paper, you sort of like don't rip the paper all the way through, you just pull it a little bit. Mm. They're, they're like the more painful ones because it's like something's been chopped but it's only been chopped in half and it's sort of – obviously then all the nerve endings are going, oh, this isn't good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I reckon – Thud's no good if we're sort of trying to sort of, I guess, simplify it. Triple pop will go as okay unless it like looks and like sounds like really gnarly and that guy's like absolutely wrecked afterwards. Yeah. And like if there's like any sort of gross instability, the little sort of like crack where you sort of just like pop, what was that? Like that's probably nine times out of ten nothing to to worry about. And then in terms of what you should do straight after, I know as we sort of touched on, really controversial with like ice and everything like that, but – Ice it straight away if it's like really swelling up because the reason why from my understanding that ice gets the really bad rap and like why the studies are against ice quite often is because they'll ice them for let's say like an hour at a time, right? And so it gets the swelling out of there, which is good, but like the swelling is what brings like the inflammatory markers that are going to basically pull away all the bad stuff and bring in the good stuff. So swelling yeah, is essentially just blood to the, to the area. Well, that's where my – can confusion comes from and, and maybe we're the basis for a lot of these papers is because yeah they'll be like oh you know uh, the icing helps with the inflammation and the swelling and then people are like no no but the inflammation and the swelling is yeah. part of that like they're the workers doing the job to fix it yeah so like mm. you want to bring in the worker so you need the swelling because that's the way that it's all the blood like let's say it's the blood because the blood is the swelling right so you need the blood to come in because it carries all the things that are going to help get out the debris and the, and the crappy stuff in there, all right? But what we don't want to do is we don't want it to get stagnant, okay? We don't want that sort of swelling just to stay there the whole time. So if we use a little bit of ice, hopefully that helps with the swelling, gets rid of that swelling like a little bit, and then like more swelling will come. It won't stop mm. the swelling completely unless you just constantly like throw your leg in an ice bucket. Well, it's to help the guys evacuate with the bad shit. Yeah, exactly. Get the guys out so you can right. get more lemmings to come in and right. sort of bring the, the stuff. So – Ice, I reckon, is really good. And then just like really like gentle movement would probably be the second big thing that I'd say to do. So if it was your elbow and your elbow like looks really big and swollen, just like legitimately within pain, like let's say one to two out of ten pain, just like bending and straightening your elbow. And so same thing with your knee, bending and straightening your knee. And with your shoulder, like probably not like rotating it all the way around because it's such a bigger like mover of the joint, but like just moving your arm up and down, side to side, as comfortably as you can, that will also help with the swelling. So your muscles do a really good job of actually helping with the swelling. So they basically act as a pump to move the blood out. So if you've got a really swollen knee and you just move your calf up and down, the calf muscle will actually pump out some of that blood that's swollen around your knee or bend your knee and use your hamstring. It'll actually help it. So like movements, small movements within like pain limits would probably be another really big thing to, to do. Um, go on to the days that we think like immobilize. Obviously it's something like super severe or like neck, obviously we're all immobilizing, but like, shoulders elbows knees like there's rarely now unless you're getting surgery on your shoulder or like some some and only like a couple of surgeries on your knee where you'll be like immobilized or anything like that so everything is all about like movement early on and then probably the only one that is probably going a little bit out of fashion is like anti-inflammatories i probably wouldn't uh hammer them early but like after 72 hours it seems like that's pretty safe to get them in there because all that sort of as we said, good stuff bringing – all the workers bring in, the good stuff has already done their job and now it's time to get some of that swelling out of there. So like after 72 hours is probably where you're looking at for um, for anti-inflammatories. Could you also include um, like a heat pack or something like that? Like you had me use the, the heat straps or was that for a different issue? Yeah, that? that was more for like – that would be more – less like those popping sensations and mm -hmm. those like those joint things that we were talking about. That'd more be muscular? more for muscular yeah. – more for like muscular spasms in terms of like neck and lower back. Like mm. if you tear your hammy, we don't really want you putting heat onto it because your hammy's not really going to seize up. Like most people have had like a bit of a sore neck in their life or a bit of a sore back. Like mm. most of the time that's coming from your muscles just seizing up, just protecting, right? Protecting that spinal spinal cord and just going, hey, listen, your back's like just a little bit irritated. Let's seize up and not let the back move. And so that heat just takes away some of that like essentially muscular spasm, best way to put it. So heat probably only really for, I'm you know, if someone just shoots me a text and they're like, hey, man, I'm not going to be able to see you anytime soon, just hurt my neck and my back, like I'll normally send back like 
get heat and get moving, so to speak. Mm. Whereas if it was more like, hey, Nick, I was just at the gym, like I got a pop in my in my knee, like what should I do? It'll probably more be down towards that like ice and still keep moving. Movement's always going to be the best because we don't want anything to tighten up on you. Uh, that, that makes sense. Yeah. And I think it, it goes counter what people want to do with an injury. Like if you hurt your elbow, you want to keep it still and like you don't yeah. want to induce any more pain or whatever. Yeah. But you're saying like, no, we need to be doing the opposite. We need to keep that movement in and like recycle uh, or get that muscle to pump out that uh, inflammation and, and, yeah. and keep it recycling. Yeah, 100%. And like I think like as you said, like, you know, you, your desire is also not to move it because it hurts to move it, but you mm. need to move it a little bit like, you know, and it's also hard to sort of get that through to some people because like the old adage was like you hurt your back. It's like, you know, you got bed rest for six weeks, so to speak. Yeah. Like don't move, <laughs> right? That's, Whereas like it's great. the exact opposite of what we want to do. We've realized that nowadays. Right. So on that, just when we're talking about heat, what are your thoughts, if, if any, on people using uh, things like Tiger Balm or, or something like that before training? Yeah. Like for those that don't know, like the, the Tiger Balm is, is kind of like deep heat. Um, it, it basically heats up your your muscle. You you apply it topically as like a like a balm. What, what are your thoughts on that? Is it is there any benefit? Because a, a lot of guys at our gym they rub it on like the back of their neck yeah. or like the back of their shoulders. Does, is it doing anything? Uh, like. The evidence would suggest probably not. Right. Um, but it is one of those things, and I get asked this a lot, like it's no sort of harm, right? So I wouldn't mm. recommend against it because like as we said about like stretching like and also pain, is, it's everyone's perception, right? And it's like some degree neurological too. So mm. if you came in and said every time I roll Tiger Balm on the back of my neck before Jiu-Jitsu, I never get any neck pain. If I don't roll Tiger Balm on my neck and then I get neck pain, like I tell you, keep rolling the tiger bar on. There's not going to be right. any harm to it. And that's what I always use with people that ask me a question that might not do any benefit, like technically from like any sort of um, like papers or anything. But mm. if I know it's not doing harm, then it's like, go and do it. There's no reason why not to. Like foam rolling is another classic one that doesn't have a lot of like, like yeah. yeah, it doesn't have a lot of evidence to it. And you have people that like absolutely hate people that foam roll. But like who's to tell someone that if they foam roll and then all of a sudden they feel like a million bucks not to do it, right? Like it makes mm. them feel like a million bucks. Let them do it, right? Yeah. So it's like I taking think, cocaine. Yeah. <laughs> that might do some help. <laughs> no evidence to support <laughs> but cocaine is bad for jujitsu. Yeah. Haven't seen that study. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, there hasn't been a paper. Nick, I, don't I don't know, know man. Yeah. <laughs> but it's funny the the you know talking about the blood and the muscles like uh pumping out the inflammation it's like the opposite of what i've got going on at the moment with my knee with yeah. the the prepatellar bursitis which is um obviously i don't have Jelly to explain knee. it to yeah, you yeah. but you know like this, knee. yeah it's like the bursts you have them in all your joints right they're little yeah, fluidy sacs for cushioning and your prepatellar one sits right at the front of your kneecap yeah. and so it's just filling with fluid and you know, you, you, I saw you multiple yeah. times about it, you and the doctor, because I've been having to get it drained and cortisone injections. And they're, you know, they're like, you can't do anything about it. It doesn't connect to any muscles, doesn't connect to the calf, the hammy, the quad. Yeah. So there's, there's no muscles can get to it to pump out that fluid. So it yeah. just pulls at the front of your knee. And, um, you know, I guess there's obviously, yeah, a wide range of injuries and body parts, but there'd be multiple things where, as part of your profession, you go, this is out of my hands. To, like you, like you got to see a doctor or yeah. a surgeon, or you know, there's nothing I can do in this situation. Yeah, hundred percent. Like, and your burst is like a great example of it, right? So, like, once you can sort of identify it, something that we, you can't help in, we've got to like move you up the food chain, right? We've got to know, like, as a physio, you got to know your own limitations and go, like, I can't fix everything. If your shoulder is dislocated. 10 times and like you've done all the strengthening, it's like, hey, time to move up the, the food chain, right? And get someone that can actually sort of go in there and move it and strengthen it, like actually physically, like, you know, tighten it up with ropes and whatever they need to do. And then like with your knee, like there's like nothing really you can do about it, right? Like it's just like, it's a fluid filled sack, as you said, that sort of its job is to shock absorb. Yours is shock absorbed so much that it's like got irritated. Um, and now once it's irritated, it's near impossible to stop it getting re-irritated. And that's like the difficulty of those ones. And then you so as a physio, you've got to just got to, as you say, make sure that you're not just getting people back because, you know, for someone that might not be like, I guess, 
has trained as much as you and have an understanding as the body as much as you, you have like a real position of power as a physio, right? Mm-hmm. Like if you had never trained before and like this knee kept like filling up with fluid, I could probably tell you, hey, come three times a week for the next 12 weeks and like yeah. we'll, we'll work on it. And then after that 12 weeks, go to you, ah, like we can't do anything about it. Go see the, yeah. uh, go yeah. see the specialist, right? So like. But it was the same with my elbow. Like when I, when I came to you with the elbow, I remember you did the initial assessment and you were like, pretty much straight away said, okay, we're going to try this and this and this, yeah. but if it's not better in whatever it was, yeah. one week, two weeks or whatever it was, you go, if it's not better from doing this, he's like, then I'm concerned there's something more serious in the joint and we need an MRI. Yeah. And then that's what it was, right? When we got the MRI and there's nothing a physio can do to be like, there's extra bone in your joint. Yeah. I'll just yeah. stretch that away. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, and so like, I think like, with certain injuries, and like we'll use both your injuries, right? The elbow has got like the bicep, the forearm muscles, the tricep all connected to it. So we might be able to strengthen it or stretch it or to, to get better. And if we create enough space, maybe those little bone spurs don't get sort of caught up in the joint and, you know, your rider's reign to continue on like you have been because like those bone spurs that you you got, like they've been developed over they years. Didn't, yeah, they didn't appear overnight. Exactly. Yeah. So you've been dealing with it because you're strong enough and flexible enough for the past let's say five years, but then it just gets to a point where, you know, there's only so much you can do and we sort of try to go, okay, let's see if we can strengthen our way out of it. No, nope. stretch our way out of it. No, nope. okay. Off to see like a, a specialist and get an MRI, whereas there's some like body parts, again, using your knee now for the example is like, as you said, the bursa is not connected to anything. Like you can't strengthen your quad to make your shock absorber less shock absorbing. All right. <laughs> so you've got to just like, you've either got to just like rest it completely with someone like you near impossible because obviously it's your your job to 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 be on your knees and working around on them um and whereas like say if you're an accountant right and like yeah you like doing jiu-jitsu but you know you'd rather not have a swollen knee we might go hey listen you gotta take six weeks off jiu-jitsu let's see if that sort of like lets it settle in that six weeks he won't have any pressure on his knee whereas if we say to you hey you've got to take six weeks off your, your knees firstly you'll say no <laughs> <laughs> secondly you'll say if you do go, yeah, I'll do it, you'll still get onto your knees yeah. numerous times throughout yeah. the day. You just will be like, oh, I'm not rolling, so it doesn't count. And it's like, well, it does count. Yeah. Um, and it'll still like flare up. So like there are some where, yeah, exactly. There's no body parts attaching to it. And if it's your job, you've got to, we've got to send you up the food chain. If it's someone we might go, okay, well, let's give it six weeks, see if it settles down and stops getting irritated, they might be able to do that too. So, yeah. yeah. So to piggyback on that, mm-hmm. when, when should someone see a physio? Like in your opinion, being one, when, when would you like, how would you want your clients or your, um, your patients to, to run through? Like what, what sort of checklist would you want them to run through before they, they come in and see you? I reckon like the first like big one is like, if it's like, if you feel like it's really serious, come and see us. Cause even yeah. if it's not like really serious and we like identify, Hey, there's just Dom's like, mm. at least you're feeling more comfortable. It will get you back to training quicker because if you think it's like a really serious, like thigh injury, but it's just Dom's like, you might not train for three weeks. So you're like, Oh geez, I've done something really bad to my thigh. I better not mm. train on it. And like, you've just missed out on that opportunity to, to train. Like, and if that's your escape, you missed out on your opportunity to escape and like all those sort of things that can cascade from that. So I think if it's real, if you feel it's serious, I think you should see a physio. All right. That would be the first one. If it felt serious, like there's an incident that felt serious, I reckon that'd be like the second point to go, yeah, go see a physio. So if you're- You mean you know, as if there was like trauma? Yeah, yeah. Like, so again, to jujitsu, like if you're feeling that big clunk that we talked about as you sort of get your elbow into position, yeah, maybe that's a time to see the physio. If you're deadlifting 200 kilos and you feel a big pop in your back, yeah, it's probably time to sort of yeah. <laughs> see a physio. And then like with like the little things where you're sort of like umming and ahhing, should I see a physio? I reckon- give it a couple of days, see if it self settles because the amount of times, again, like these things like self settle and we might only see someone once at once is like, it's, I wouldn't say it's extremely high, but there's definitely those people that just, that come in and you probably like from a physio perspective, if they've seen them a couple of times, you sort of know that person. Like when you see them book in, you're sort of like, okay, this most likely won't be anything sort of serious because they might be a little bit more inclined to be a hypochondriac on it. But you've also got to take them seriously too because that's the one you also miss as well, right? That sort of someone's come in with like doms essentially five times and then like all of a sudden they come in and like, oh, my knee's a little bit sore and you sort of like fob them off because you think, oh, this guy again, like he's always coming in with something a little bit sore and then you realise, oh, I missed the ACL or something like that. So like mm-hmm. as a physio, you've got to keep your eye out for that. But like if you're if you're like feeling like, oh, this doesn't feel and you're umming and ahhing, like 
should I see a physio? I reckon give it a couple of days and see what it's, what happens. And then in that couple of days is not going to be the difference between like you recovering and you not recovering. It might be the difference between a, an extra week sort of out of sport or whatever it is, but it won't be anything really long-term. Like most things that are time sensitive, you're aware you're injured. Does that right. make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. So to yeah. pit some professions against each other, no, not, not <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. but, do, you know, obviously – no one's a master of everything, so different professions specialize in different things. Obviously, if you had an injury where, you know, a bone is sticking through your skin, you're going to mm. go to the hospital or, you know, it, the oh, work. Oh, I better book him in there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, like availability the, tomorrow, right? Yeah. So, Still like, bleeding. I guess like, the, oh, maybe not. <laughs> I guess the word, but I'm more, I guess, talking physios and doctors, right? So, Or let's just say GPs because – you know, obviously a GP has a whole bunch of expertise that, yeah. that physios don't have and physios have expertise that doctors don't have because yeah. physios don't need to learn all the stuff that doctors have to learn. You know, yeah. no one can know everything. So then is there – I don't know if this is easy or difficult to answer, but ignoring a massive trauma like you clearly know yeah. your arm's broken in half or something. So is there sort of something when, should you kind of always, in your opinion, when it's – the sort of injuries you're going to get in jujitsu, muscular joint, see a physio because they're better equipped to deal with it than a doctor or are there times where it's like, oh, you should just go to the GP? Uh, I reckon for most musculoskeletal injuries, so anything that feels like it's like your muscle or like your joint or something, I'd probably say physio probably should be your first point of call. And that's not because we're smarter than doctors or anything like that. It's just the fact that I see – those cases every day that's all i do right i only do like muscles joints and i guess nerves as well if you sort of compass that in so like you don't have people coming in saying like i've got this itchy yeah, rash exactly. on my arm right so they've got to be <laughs> they've got to know everything right and like on their totem pole someone having like a strained quad is so low on their totem pole, right? Yeah, They're looking yeah. out for people with like heart issues, yeah. weird rashes, everything uh, else. And yeah, and I think, uh, yeah, I definitely agree with that. And I think in my expertise, you know, prior to, to jujitsu and working with physios and everything, and if I'd ever go to the doctor, you're typically just sent off for an x-ray. Yeah. You know, even when you know nothing's broken, they, I mean, they've just got their process of elimination because yeah, yeah. they won't send you for an MRI or – you know, an ultrasound, not the ultrasounds yeah. we were talking about before, but, yeah. you know, the, I don't know what the diagnostic, a diagnostic ultrasound, you know, it's all, okay, you got to do an x-ray first yeah. and, and then here they're going to prescribe you some strong yeah. pain meds or. Yeah. So, and that is the tough thing f with the doctors as well. They'll often go x-ray because it's also free, right? Getting an x-ray is totally free. Whereas mm. like. In Australia it is. In not, Australia, not for our yeah. poor <laughs> American <laughs> listeners. No, no, definitely not. <laughs> uh, They're like, what? You guys get them for free? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, they'll send you for that. And because it, it's, yeah, it's the easy one. It rules out the big, na like some of the big nasties. Like, because if you've got a big break, like it's important to know that. But like, mm. you know, if you've got a broken bone, you sort of kind, you kind of, of know. know. Yeah, exactly. It feels different. Um, that'll be a big crack if we're going back to our cracks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I reckon musculoskeletal injuries go see like a, a physio first and foremost because the reality is let's say like I had someone come in last week, right, and he's done his knee playing rugby. Like he was just sidestepping, classic ACL mechanism. He came and saw me first before seeing a doctor. It's We tested it, so like, okay, we're gonna go get you get an MRI. So we can write them a referral for that MRI, mm. but it will cost that guy 350 bucks to get an MRI. Whereas then if I go to him, hey, now go see a doctor, with the, if they write down basically ACL or meniscus, which is what we thought it was, mm -hmm. um, they get the MRI for free. So there'll be an instance there where I'll sort of push them in the to right the, direction yeah, anyway. Yeah. So like most of the time, you know, we sort of deal with it, but like at the same time, like if we think, hey, you've come to the wrong place, we'll send you straight off to to the doctor as well. So like, mm. um, again, like I reckon physio is going to be that first point of call, and if, if physio is not the right call, then you know the physio should point you straight to the to the doctor. If Similar you, again, yeah. what we did with your elbow and stuff too. Yeah, uh, um, slightly off topic, but I'm just curious now. Yeah. You mentioned that why why is it that I wish I had one of those little you know like knee oh, joint yeah, yeah, things yeah, yeah. that doctors and physios always have? Why is it that the ACL like the ACL is made to stop the shin moving yeah, forward. forwards in yeah. relation to the thigh or the knee, if, if yeah. you will, right? So why is it with a side step that 
the ACL tends to go. Like I would imagine that a sidestep would be more your LCL, like the lat, like that yeah. would get more load. Your when you sidestep, it's like yes, you're planting your foot right. So and why it happens more often with football players is because they've got rugby boots on too, right? So the foot goes into the ground, so your shin essentially stays in that one spot because your studs dig into the ground, and then your sort of femur or your thigh moves essentially and, and you obviously gonna, have some forward uh, momentum as well exactly. right? so you're not sort of like side shuffling right like you're not going to do your acl just doing like those like side skips that you sort yeah, of just yeah. feet go together feet go apart feet go together as you sort of go it'll be like you're side stepping so you're planting so all that force is like traveling you forward and you're pivoting off at the same time so going in a different direction so if your shin stays there and then your thigh bone starts moving because you're trying to right. get it basically pops and because it will be it goes under tension before your LCL goes under tension and right. you uh, so being your lateral ligament and so your lateral ligament gets done when it's basically just if you imagine your legs up straight as you sort of just poke it out so mm. to speak so when you do a side step you're not just either going just to the side or just forward you're sort of doing a combo right. of both and it's that multi-directional movement that causes your could acl you, to go could you do your pcl as well with that or not really? less likely less likely so your acl is going to be in that sort of condition your your pcl is much less likely to get ruptured and it's also one that is even like it's less important so quite often people if they have like an only a pcl injury won't get it won't get it fixed you've just got to really strengthen up like essentially your quads and hamstrings um, so it does essentially the opposite movement to your to your ACL, um, and how that happens more actually the most common way is actually in a car crash. So if you imagine in a car crash, the as you sort of go forward, right, your legs go forward, and then the dashboard comes back. So it's the dashboard banging into your knees, and as we said, it does the opposite movement. So it's your shin bone going backwards. Oh, it ruptures your um, ruptures your your PCL. So that's the most common way of that sort of happening. Right. Ouch. Uh, now the the question I wanted to ask <laughs> at, the, at the start, there's, and, a, there's a laughter and a smile. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, because well, I don't want. I mean, I'm happy to dump shit on whoever and whatever. We don't want to put you. in I a don't want to put oh, you yeah. in a in a position. We're getting but, you to dump shit. <laughs> um, you know, like I I personally cringe a lot when people say like, oh yeah, so, you know, this is sore and whatever, and I've been seeing my Cairo, and I'm like fucking Cairo, like why, like. I don't know what, as a professional yeah. with chiropractors and uh, in my opinion being pseudoscience, yeah. but I can also see the success in it because having parts of your, your, your body like popped and yeah, cracked feels, feels really good. Yeah. You know, what's the, I don't know, as a physio, not necessarily your opinion on chiropractors, but I mean, where do you see that profession? Does it, I mean... Well, no, physios I, I, versus I chiropractors. I understand kind of why a, you're sort of asking around the question rather than asking the question. But like, I think in the old days they used to have like a there's like this big rivalry between physio and chiros, right? Where like physios didn't like chiros, chiros didn't like physio. But the reality is like there's good and bad physios, just like you sort of alluded to those ones that and like I alluded to earlier that like still throw you on the machines or they mm. sort of you know say hey come back three times this week you know for the next like 12 weeks so there's there's definitely physios out there that do that um and there's bad chiros out there right that are sort of like hey you need to get an adjustment every month your hips are out of alignment your back's out of alignment like they're the ones you know in both professions you want to avoid because they're essentially in it for the the money and like make no mistake i enjoy getting paid for what i do but like you know, but you got into it to help people. Yeah, not, you know, hundred yeah. percent, right? And so, um, I think there's good and bad physios, good and bad chiros, and I think actually the good chiros and the good physios are actually like converging, right? Like they're starting to realize that like a little bit of this and a little bit of that does help. So a little bit of physio, a little bit of like chiro can definitely help. And so the way that I use massage, right, is to, as I said, like hopefully give like some relief, like a bit of a neurological response. People like it and they feel that perceived benefit for it. And as a result, they get benefit from it. Okay. Same thing happens with the chiro and the adjustments. Like we said, like when you, but they're cracking it, make no mistake about it. They're not putting your joints back in place. No one's that no, strong. No, yeah, I and know. Like, it's, not, it's not like, yeah. yeah. And like that used to be the thing, right? It's like, hey, your back's out, come in. I'll just like crack it back in the place. And it's yeah. like, <laughs> if well, you're, yeah, if it was out of place, yeah. you would be in you're, some. Yeah, you're on the hospital floor, right? Like in agony. So. Um, like they're not doing that, but what they are doing is similar to a massage. They're providing you that like short-term relief. And then on top of that, 
then they should be prescribing the mobility and the strengthening exercise. Just like physio should do some releases and then provide the strength and mobility. So like I've got nothing against chiros um, and I think like you'll we'll find in the next like five to ten years that they gets like closer and closer to each other and they should nearly be the same thing. And the same thing's happening with physios and I'll say like – trainers rather nothing against again pts or anything like that but like really high level trainers like they're sort of starting to realize hey we need to get some like stretching and mobility through they're not all just about like lift lift as heavy weight as possible and physios are also now not all about hey you just need to stretch and use these like little rubber bands to make you stronger it's like hey we need to get you exposed to some heavier weights or Mm -hmm. like when you're coming back from an acl we've got to get you like jumping around to get your knee ready to jump around and change direction and everything like that so i think like if we group those like three different areas they're all sort of hopefully converging onto one and we should find that you know, it's really a mixture of all that sort of is your best benefit. Mm. What about is the the thing that is hard to get my head around it? And I think for most people who don't go to chiropractors and don't in whether you like them or not, but even you know, wh- sorry, whether you're for them or against them, but even if you're someone who doesn't have a problem with them but doesn't enjoy going to them, like the whole getting your neck cracked thing. Like is there a time and place for that or is that just one of those? Yeah, I think like if you find benefit from it, definitely like there's a time and place for it. Like there are some conditions where you don't want to get your neck cracked Well, you well. read horror stories about chiropractors practicing on like infants yeah. and toddlers, which I mean I know is the extreme, yeah, yeah. but like I can't imagine a world where a one-year-old needs to get their neck adjusted yeah it's not really my uh my thing that i'm doing with my kids or anything like that but there is (laughs) definitely some people like they come in they're saying like you know i take my kid like once a week to get their back cracked and like they might be only like anywhere under the age of five even and like it's not my job to like really go hey listen you shouldn't do that you're playing with fire but like potentially they are playing with fire but anyone that's got a kid knows like when sometimes you pick them up and they're like, you know, they're playing with them and arching your back, you feel their back go crack, 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 crack. So there's like, there's a degree that it probably doesn't do any harm. It's just that they're so flexible. You get the joint to the end of range and just like me cracking my knuckles, it's the same sort of thing. Mm. But yeah, I'd be wary of like a Kyra that's telling me cracking my child's neck is going to help with some sort of like ADHD, which is like some of the things you do. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> we have Fuck one of you, uh, you've seen him, couple of times yeah. you know my student aaron yeah with the oh name and, and shame and thing. Uh, yeah oh yeah well, we've told this story on the podcast okay. before it's fucking hilarious yeah. he goes so he was like leaving training one day like uh semi early he wasn't doing like the the class that i would have expected him to do yeah, yeah. i'm like i'm like why he's, he's like oh man my back's fucked i'm like I'm like, what'd you do? And he's like, oh, okay. So I went and got a haircut and I'm like, what? He's like, he's like, <laughs> he's like, hear me out, hear me out. And he's like, he's like, so I was getting a haircut. And then the barber was like, do you want me to crack your neck for you? And I was like, yeah, why not? He cracked my neck. He's like, my back's fucked. And I'm like, bro, I was like, what in, the I said, fuck? in what world, in what uh, world would you stuff. let a barber crack your neck, bro? He's like, yeah, I can't, oh, my back. I'm like, you dude, it. that is the dumbest thing yeah. I've ever heard. That's an upsell. Yeah, ever that's heard good. One. I haven't charged him for it <laughs> <Yeah>. too. <laughs> um, um, I don't think he's like, he's nine times out of 10, not going to do any long-term damage. And it sounds if we're talking about it, he didn't do any long-term damage to Aaron. Um, but like probably just more of a muscular response going like, what the so hell was that? Up and seized up, right? Yeah, and that's yeah. probably the most common thing I see with some people that go to Cairo's. Like rarely are they, you know, cracking something and like really like badly damaging, damaging them. But there are some conditions where you might naturally have like a disc or like a vertebra that's a little bit shifted forward and mm. like – there's you you don't want to crack that because you can like you won't physically like shift it like crazy but you might push it a little bit that just pushes on a nerve and then all of a sudden you get some really like nasty stuff sort of happen so there are like contraindications for cracking and that's again probably where bad chiros come into it where they don't do like a thorough assessment and figure out Mm. the bad contraindications and same happens for physio like there'd be contraindications for some things that we do that you know, like I do some dry needling that, you know, again, like if we go down the evidence path, doesn't have a lot of evidence, but gives some people some really good relief. Mm. But like if you're anemic, I don't want to do dry needling to it because mm. you're going to you're gonna bleed a little bit yeah, too yeah. much. Yeah. Um, but like so back to the chiros, like if they're cracking something when you've already got like a pre-existing like 
injury around that neck, like it can be a little bit dangerous. It's like, as I said, it's very uncommon, but it's also one of those things, again, if you're not like screening someone on that, you might, you might not know. And then you, you do a crack and say, if you're the barber and you're not, it doesn't sound like, <laughs> it doesn't sound like you screened him very well. Yeah. Oh my God. Um, you could potentially do some, some damage to it too. So sure. what about remedial or like sports massage, remedial massage? Cause I, from the neck injury after it got a bit, a bit better. So yeah. it wasn't like immense. I started yeah. to, to see a, um, a masseuse for remedial. Yeah. And then she started to say, Oh, you need to see me every three days, yeah. every four days. I'm like, yeah, we're done. Yeah. You're done. You're done. So, <laughs> I think it's the same as like a bad physio and a bad courage. Not necessarily that that masseuse was bad, but yeah. like, when they're just trying to upsell you, you yeah. know when you get an upsold on, Man, right? It was a huge red flag. I saw her twice and then when she's like, yeah, every three days you're training so much. You, yeah. You need this. I'm like, no. And like, need. it's like, oh, you've got this like knot here that never like releases. And like yeah, yeah, the most yeah, common yeah. one is because most people like like a massage the upper back around the neck and you've yeah. got this one muscle that basically if you go down like the your, your neck down, you're trapped towards your shoulder. If you go hard enough, you'll feel this like bump as you go over because it's just a muscle going the opposite way. Yeah. But that's the most common one that I'll chat to someone. They'll be like, oh, you feel that bump? And I was like, yeah. It's like, oh, that's the one I go to my masseuse and she's been trying to get this knot out for years <laughs> but, and she just hasn't got it out or he. She's like, um, that's because she would need to surgically remove it. And that is exactly what I say. It's like, well, they'd have feel, to chop I that muscle. I feel fucking duped, man. <laughs> you got that. This, this is, exactly <laughs> is this how it played out? <laughs> I'm not even fucking kidding. Yeah. I'm like my face started going red and I started to get angry because yeah. when she was like on the second time, she had me on the table. was like, yeah, you really need to see me or feel this and yeah. went straight to that fucking bump yeah god damn it yeah scammed so like oh, gone are the days we think like you get these like big knots of balls essentially that are in your like your muscles or anything like yeah. that but like yeah that's the classic one right like it's and, and it feels like a knot right and like it's we've been preconditioned to be told that you have this knot and knot, yeah. knot and you've heard people say i've got a knot in my shoulder so you think oh, this must be something that some people get and now i've got one damn it and then like you're seeing the massage therapist for the next 10 years. Yeah. yeah. $120 a fucking session. Yeah. But at the same time, like massage can also like be really beneficial. So the way sometimes I like it and something like a massage too, like everything you do in life fills up your cup of tolerance. Right. And I think I gave you probably I love this. Skill, this. Right? Yeah. Like, I love this analogy. So if you have like a, a liter bottle of water, everything you do in life adds to that bottle of water, whether it be going to jujitsu, which might add a hundred mils and the numbers are arbitrary, going to the gym adds another hundred mils, sitting at a desk for 10 hours straight adds another 200 mils. And sooner or later, if you do too much, you essentially overflow and you get a niggle. It's nothing bad. It's nothing like to worry about, but you just get some like ache or pain. So something like a masseuse essentially like basically puts a hole in that cup temporarily to take a hundred mils out. So if you did regular massage, yeah, you probably are going to be a little bit more, uh, less likely to be injured because you'll be constantly feeling like that a little bit better. Like we all feel better after a massage, right? Mm. But so like things like that take water out, things like doing the trigger ball, even though again, no no major evidence or foam roller takes a little bit of water out. Doing some stretching takes some water out. But at the same time, you want to get a bigger cup. So we sort of use the idea of we had a liter. And so the way to get a bigger cup is like to get stronger or to get exposed to more different things. So if we use, go back all the way to our sort of start of our conversation with jujitsu. If we get your neck stronger, instead of having a liter a cup to deal with, Till you sort of get a niggle in your neck, you might have a 1.25 liter bottle to before you get injured. If you're stronger and more mobile through your neck, like you eventually just get a bigger capacity to tolerate whatever you're doing in life, whether that be training, work, leisure activities, whatever. It's such a good analogy because then you could use like the band aid fix of the equivalent of saying like, you know, because if you don't, you know, deal with this water and overflowing cup, if you try to just put a lid on the cup it's then going to get to a point where it just explodes yeah. and then like you have a, ma you know, a severe yeah, injury. You get, and it might not even be a severe injury, but it might just be like you get a super spasm and like, you know, yeah. you had it with your neck where you basically can't turn your neck. And it's like, that's really debilitating. Like the neck ones are like one of the more painful injuries, yeah, even if fucked. they're not, even if they're not severe, right? Yeah. Like it's not like we went and got you a scan or anything like that. It's no. just like, but you couldn't turn your neck and yeah. you realize how much you need to turn your neck. Fucking <laughs> oath. Oh man. It was so painful. I, I couldn't even sleep. Like I, yeah. that's what was really scary me about it and yeah. i suppose back to what we we've saying before when you have white belts and then they're like oh i'm not used to this position so it, you know they get, they get confused with doms yeah that's essentially what happened to me almost yeah. like I, it's your I, first experience with like really bad neck pain right exactly yeah yeah, yeah it scared the fuck out of me yeah i'm um, good i know we're going over time but i 
just want to ask one more question, one more professional question. Going back to, you know, we're talking about, you know, Kairos cracking kids and whatever, because I think this is relevant to, you know, listeners who uh, either own gyms and they have kids training in the gym. So parents ask them questions or, um, you know, there's people who are listening who their kids do jujitsu mm. as well. So then um, professionally speaking, like what's the, you know, uh, is there a, a, what's the word? Like, is there a, a niche or a specialty in physios that essentially do pediatric physios or yeah. like, so, or for you, what is the limit that, oh no, I don't treat three-year-olds or I mean, not, not many three-year-olds do jujitsu, yeah, but yeah. in our gym, for example, they start at four. Yeah. So, you know, if a parent has a seven or eight-year-old who they they were wrestling and tweaked their neck or whatever, like how should parents deal with their you know, kids yeah. having sort of jujitsu related injuries or niggles. Yeah. So like, I guess first part of the question was like, is there pediatric physio? And there is hundred percent. And it is just called pediatric physios, but you'll find them in the hospitals more. And what mm. they're dealing is with like kids with like, essentially like growth, birth deformities or, or some post-surgery, yeah, post-surgery sort of rehab, like, and they're probably more like attuned to sort of like, getting them like using like motor skills and stuff like that. So they, they're rarely going to mess like massage them or do anything like that. Um, they probably already know the diagnosis cause it's probably some sort of more like systemic, like actual proper illness. That's like doctor related. Then they've gone, okay, you've got this, this is going to cause this. You need to go see a physio about it. So the physio sort of just prescribes based on pretty much what the doctor is. Um, and you sort of want to go down I guess that path with like more serious conditions. But when we're talking about like sort of sports injuries, let's call it, or jiu-jitsu injuries with, with kids, like I always say like rest and see first and foremost with kids, right? Mm. Because, you know, with kids it's hard to tell whether they're actually injured or not injured. Obviously if like they've fallen over or they've got put in like it, like they maybe they got, you know, I'm sure they get fall over all the time in in your classes, right? And like they fell awkwardly on their arm. Like you'll probably know if there's like a little break in the arm. And that's probably the most common thing you'll see in a kid's like because their bones are still developing, they get these things called like green stri- green stick fractures, which are like small little fractures in your arm from just like the bone just not being strong enough yet, right? Like our bones grow in response to stress. They haven't had that much stress. They're still developing. They're still getting all their hormones and stuff like that. So they might get like a little fracture like that. In that case, you want to go down sort of like a, a doctor path because they might sort of end up in like, let's say it's the forearm, end up in a cast or something like that. But again, you'll probably know that, right? The kid will fall over, they'll be crying and they won't sort of probably stop crying. It's not going to be like who anyone has kids where a kid falls over, you distract them with a, you know, a lolly or something and all of a sudden it doesn't hurt again. <laughs> yeah. um, so like with the ones where they seemingly like are just in this like constant pain and you know your kid and it's like that's not their norm, I'd probably go to a, like a doctor first and foremost. So that'd be another instance where a doctor's probably best because I will get an x-ray, see if it's that. If that's cleared, I always say give it a couple of days with kids because it's their first time, like we just said about your neck, it's their first time getting injured most of the Yeah, they don't, the time. They, they don't have experience to, yeah. regardless of how much it hurts or not, they haven't had enough experience to know if it's bad or – If it's going to come and better. And you're right? just trying to mm. take – it's like trying to figure out if you need to take your dog to the vet or yeah. not. You're like, oh, you t- talk I, to me. I, I, t- yeah. <laughs> I reckon that's a great analogy, right, because – <laughs> Uh, maybe they're a bit smarter than dogs, but like, you know, like <laughs> not they're, lot, not, they're not going to know, right? So I always say let it see how it settles down and like hopefully, again, like nine times out of ten, um, I think that's the thing M's going to get me on for this podcast is saying nine times out of ten. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, it will just sort of self-resolve and it will be nothing really, really bad. And then if like it's like been like three days, it's clearly not like something that they're constantly in pain, but maybe they're just like limping around a little bit and there was their ankle or something like mm. come in and see the physio. What we'll probably do is more than anything, calm the parents for you more than anything else. Um, there might be some little things that they have to do. We might have to sort of get them to stop doing something. It might be, hey, listen, like this isn't the time for your kid to keep going back to jiu-jitsu or if they, you know, it's their ankles like, oh, maybe back off the gymnastics or whatever it may be. And it might be just like give it some little bit of time to rest. Mm. But they're so like pliable, right, and everything like that. It's rarely, if ever, going to be like a you know they've torn their meniscus or yeah, like yeah. they've torn a ligament or something like that. So I think with kids, it's like if it looks serious and it's like they're acting a bit out of their norm, get them off to see like a a, a doc. If it's sort of something that seems to be, you know, oh, they cried a little bit about it, and maybe they're limping for a day or two, just see if it sort of sticks around. And if it doesn't stick around, like post a week, 
don't feel bad if you're coming in a week later and say, oh, they've been complaining about it for a week because sometimes it just falls by the wayside. If it's mm. been over a, a week and they're still like doing things differently, right, like they're not putting weight on their foot or something like that, that's when you sort of come and see a physio and it might just be more calm in the parents' fear and also calm in the kids' fear because, again, it's their first time depending on their mm. age, like if they're more towards that seven or eight like telling them that it's going to be okay then all of a sudden they they feel better yeah from that, to have right? a professional tell them yeah, yeah exactly they sort of it's not mum and dad who they listen to all the time or something mm. like that so um yeah i think you've just gotta probably don't run to the physio would be my answer like my niece like plays soccer and she like rolled her ankle and she's um she's she's under 10 so like uh like it was never going to be anything serious, but like it was like nice and swollen, and like by you know a week or two, my sister like took her to to see a physio, and like they were like, hey, it's nothing big, but we've just got to like back her off how much she's running and yeah. stuff like that. So, do you have a do you have a do you and M have a line in the sand of an age that you don't deal with? Uh, yeah, I reckon like anything, probably even under like six, like it it, it will probably be a chat on the convers on the phone because most time people will like book online, uh, I mean, book like over the phone with us. And so they'll call me up and be like, who's it for? And then they'll be like, oh, it's like a, my new three-year-old or something like that. And at that yeah. time we sort of like nearly even like triage them and sort of be like, okay, what's happened? Like give us a rundown. It's like, oh, maybe don't see us. Go see like the doctor or something. So we'll triage those like younger kids and everything like that. Um, so that's probably the best way to, to do it rather than just like a – a thick line in the sand, but I, yeah, I, I mean, couldn't tell you if I've case. treated someone under the age of five. I don't think so. Probably not even six or seven, if I'm honest with you. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. I had one final question. Mm-hmm. When are we going to see you on the mats at Vantage Jiu Jitsu? Well, I, I think I touched on this already, right? Like I, I think I would be. The hard word is on. Disrespecting, uh, disrespecting Vantage Jiu Jitsu by going there, right? Because it'll be like a, a one <laughs> trip you're there, disrespecting right? Disrespecting us not to, man. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I'll go there once, right? And I'll just be like, this is so bloody hard. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, where does this fit into my schedule? But, He's surely going to have more time once the third baby comes. Oh, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That will Way free up your time. calendar. But yeah, like, I don't know. If you guys think there's a point to come down and get like, beat up for an hour just to get everyone back. You might just line up the people that I've seen and basically they just go one <laughs> yeah, one yeah, and just yeah, just <laughs> drilling through me. You give me no like pointers or anything like we'll that. I just go honest. and just get, hey, you're just going to go one-on-one with Kieran for a bit. It's like, I've never done this before. It's like, get in there. And yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's a way to get everyone to get me back from me digging their elbows into their backs and whatever. <laughs> Actually, sorry. And I know that was supposed to be the last one, but I did have, yeah, questions. I know yeah. there's been a lot of last questions, <laughs> but I right. think if anyone's still listening, it'll, it'll be, Everyone. Re- relevant. <laughs> uh, without just quickly going over it, as a uh, what do people need to know about taping? So uh, again, obviously, I know it's a broad question. Yeah, it depends on the joint, the injury, whatever. But obviously, there's certain things where it gets to a point. Well, hey, you don't want to tape or support this because yeah. you're actually promoting the the muscles not mm. to do their yeah. job. So, is there a bit of just generic advice as to when to tape versus not to tape? I reckon because people in jujitsu, man, they tape like they everything. tape everything. Tape their fingers. fingers. Like I want yeah. to ask about that. What, they just what's tape the bloody everything. You know? Um, if it's like that sort of classic, like buddy taping of the fingers. Taping two together. Yeah, two together. Mm-hmm. So like that's often like if you've jarred your finger, like you just basically can't bend it. So by taping it together, you give that one that can't bend some support. So then it's mm-hmm. hopefully a little bit less painful, but then it also allows you to bend it a little bit more because the other one basically pulls it down. So like mm-hmm. um, in terms of taping though, and sort of to try to answer the question is I reckon if you've just done something that's like, and you're just recently irritated and it needs like a degree of immobilization. So like a thumb's a really common one that I would actually recommend to sort of tape. Like if you jar your thumb again, you're not going to really strengthen your thumb like crazily in a week, but you still might want to be able to roll and you probably still can roll, but it's like just jarred and irritated. You basically a little bit of tape around your thumbs, a good way to just provide that support and allow you to keep training. Keep doing that at the same time, doing probably some like little bit of strengthens on the side. And as you start to realize like the thumb doesn't get like put in a position as often and doesn't get as irritated as often, you just start taking that tape off. So that would be number one, like an irritation that you find the tape helps it like in that short term, tape it up, allows you to keep training. Happy days. We want you to keep training as much as possible. Uh, Coming back from surgery, I reckon is another big one that like tape. So like people are coming back from an ACL 
often like the support of like a little bit of tape just to feel confident. The tape's probably really not going to stop you doing it, right? You see footy players all the time, you know. Footy sidestep. players, yeah, they have heaps of tape, yeah, right? right? And their yeah. knee's taped up and they sidestep and their knee still goes. Basically, they've done studies on tape and realised there is some good like sh- like strengthening to it like early on. like it, But it, after like 20 minutes, like the, the tensile strength of the tape is – next to i won't say next to number like it's it's useless in stopping like the big movements that's going to actually injure you there's a degree where they think it's actually like a proprioceptive thing so Mm. if you imagine when you have some tape as you're getting into that extreme that it's trying to avoid your your skin will feel like the pull of the tape and so they actually think like there's like a little bit of a brain reaction there where it basically goes it'll back off yeah Yeah. yeah, interesting So, so that can be really helpful for like yeah, people like post yeah post surgery where they just feel more comfortable, and so if that allows them to train a little bit early, they should have passed all the protocols that allowed them to train anyway. But that just might be that safety net for them. But again, like you said, we probably want them to get off that safety net at some stage. But at the same time, right? Like again, most of the people you you train aren't going for like world championships, and if that allows them to keep training, they feel more comfortable. Kind of like the tiger balm thing, yeah, like exactly it's, it's to you know, depending, but it's, so there's almost like an element of placebo. Yeah. To, to a certain degree. So I reckon that'd be like the two most common, like sort of use of the tape, like, you know, to immobilize something to a certain degree um, and just stop it getting into those ranges. And then like a bit of confidence, like post like surgery or even Mm. a bit of confidence post injury, right? Like you might not have even had surgery. Like if you injure your like medial ligament in your knee, often like people tape up after that, they might not have needed surgery, but again, it just gives you that like extra layer of, confidence and yeah i reckon that's the best way to sort of think about it and then what's the deal with that rock tape stuff oh like the kinesio tape yeah yeah it got super popular after i think it was like the 2004 maybe even yeah 2004 2008 olympics because like, is that a legit or disproven thing that's or? the really bright colored yeah. tape so that that's like the one runs where it, in a line yeah and it's quite expensive yeah, too. yeah, yeah what's yeah. the deal with that so tape? like the theory originally behind it was it was going to assist the muscles like a little bit so say if you teared your tore your hamstring you put that tape down your hamstring and it gives you that like little bit of extra percent to help your hamstring work. Like as you think about it, right? So yeah, you're making those eyes. That's like a bit of a theory behind it. The second theory is that it basically um, pulls like there's different layers of our muscle, uh, our body, right? So you've obviously got the skin that everyone sees and then there's like the fascia and then mm-hmm. there's like muscles and there's all stuff in between. It's supposed to help like the sliding surfaces between uh, those uh, okay. those areas. Again, it's been sort of disproven, but like – for example, I've torn my hammy a couple of times in footy. When I recovered from my hammy tear, I put on the kinesio tape. Mm. Did it help? Don't know, but I played with <laughs> but, it and but I it helped didn't you. Hurt. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, like, I've got again no harm harm with it. Uh, when you see someone that looks like a mummy, though, then that's the sort of like, oh, that's no harm. <laughs> yeah. Maybe there is some psychological harm happening yeah. at this stage. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's sort of been disproven. But again, another classic one: if it makes you feel better. Who am I to say not to do it, right? Yeah. How yeah. about that science getting away with fun? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, it looks – Yeah, some people yeah. think it looks cool. Yeah. Each to their own. All right. Well, let's wrap it up there, guys. It's been – Nick, thank you so much no, for coming pleasure. on. Thanks it's, very much. It's been an absolute blast. So, obviously, Active RX Physio uh, can find you on Instagram. Is that your mm-hmm. handle? Yeah, that's the handle on Instagram too. Right. Website, activerxphysio.com.au. 100%. Uh, yeah, you can just man type it into Google in Maroubra Junction. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, yeah, if anyone needs a physio, I, I send everyone to Nick. Mm-hmm. And every time they come back, yeah, man, he's really good. Like I fucking told you, why didn't you go three <laughs> weeks ago, Kieran, when your neck was sore? I told you. <laughs> Shut up, bro. <laughs> yeah, very good. Thanks, if anyone's in Sydney, definitely check it out. Over 100 five-star reviews on Google. Ah, thank you very much. <laughs> Doing the research. Mate, yeah. all over it. So thanks so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed the podcast, you guys know where to find us. Uh, we are at Beyond Jiu Jitsu underscore podcast on Instagram. Become a Patreon, all that good stuff. And until next time, see ya.